Hello and welcome to Quartic Training. This Essential Financial Maths course is designed for candidates that wish to brush up on their numeracy skills. This could be because you're doing an exam, whether it's the Chartered Financial Analyst Program, the IMC Investment Management Certificate, the any of the CISI regulatory exams, or it could be a university course or a master's course that involves financial mathematics skills. It could well be that this is not aiming at an exam. It's that the course should be suitable whether or not you're studying for such an exam. As we work our way through the material, we'll be making reference to, in particular, the CFA calculator, which has a number of financial functions. So this is the Texas Instruments BA2+, Plus. you can see here. I'll explain this as we go. However, this is not a major part of the course. The course is designed for your own numerical skills and not calculator skills. The calculator is purely incidental. And if you're interested in learning much more about how the calculator functions, we do have a separate online seminar. So please contact us for details on that. The contents that we're going to be looking at, we're going to start off with algebraic notation. First of all, the basics of how we apply brackets and the sequence of how we do calculations. We'll look at indices and powers, a little bit of algebra, check we can do some algebraic notation. Percentages, we need to do a lot of different types of calculations on percentages. We'll look at reciprocals and a bit of foreign exchange as an application and summation notation. We must understand how maths notation works. In the second section, we look at time value of money, which is saying that we prefer $100 today to $100 in a year's time. We'll look at how that works, some of the mathematics behind it, and how we can use that to, valuing, uh, to, to value a lot of financial products. We'll look at annuities and perpetuities, and also nominal and effective rates. Under applications, we'll focus on net present value and internal rate of return. This is saying, what is the net worth in today's terms of a particular product if we know the cash flows? And the internal rate of return is saying, what return is a particular set of cash flows generating for us? We'll then apply that to uh, financial bonds. We'll look at bonds and how those cash flows work uh, and use the NPV and IRR skills on that. Uh, we'll also then conclude with some taxation because tax is clearly a part of most people's financial life. Uh, in the last section, we'll introduce statistics. We'll look at central tendency, mean, arithmetic and geometric means, and then we'll look at dispersion, which is standard deviations and variances with lots of calculations as we go. So that's the outline. Section one, back to basics, notation and algebra. In this section, we aim to become comfortable with how calculations are shown to us, how they're presented on the page. If we're given a page, if we're given a line of symbols, how do we interpret it? How do we know what sequence to do to press buttons on the calculator and so on? Let's kick off with the basic sequence. This next section is on percentages. This is absolutely fundamentally the percentages are ubiquitous they come up everywhere in finance percentages are simply a way of expressing something out of a hundred if we say we're 50 percent certain it means 50 out of 100 which is half 0.5 and it means we're equally likely for something to happen as something else to happen if we say we're 99 percent certain it means the chances are only one in a hundred that will be wrong often you hear People say, I'm going to give it 110% effort, which, of course, is absolutely rubbish. You can't go anything above 100%. When he says, particular with sporting commentators, and they say, oh, we're going to do 1,000% on this. Of course, were a politician to say, we're going to be 99% committed to this campaign, then, of course, that sounds absolutely dreadful, though 99% committed to a campaign actually is pretty high. Anyway, quipping aside, what we need to understand is the percentage is simply something out of 100. You can see the percent sign. There's the 1, there's the 0, there's the 0. So it sort of looks like a 100. Uh, if you look at a calculator, pressing the percent button, the percentage button uh, often just reduces the value. So if we look on this and we say we're looking at 80%, you do 80 you then press the percent button and it gives you 0.8. You're just dividing by 100. Uh, let's now do some applications of this. $400 times 20%. So let's say we have bought something for $400 and let's say we have to pay an additional 20%. So what does 20% mean? 
20% is 20 out of 100, so 0 0.2. So this means 400 times 0 0.2. And in this case, you can see that equals um, so one fifth of 400, which is $80. On the calculator, just to demonstrate how this works, if you say 400 times 20%, so that's turned the screen into 0.2, and that gives you your 80. Now let's say we want to add 20%. So example here might be a sales tax out of, let's say there's 20% value added tax, VAT. So 400 pounds, And when we say plus 20%, what it means is we're taking 400 and we're adding on 20% of 400. Now, we really know 20% of 400. Section 2, time value of money. This second part of the course talks about how money moves through time. We're going to look at the concept of compounding, of discounting, annuities, perpetuities, different types of interest rate, what indeed interest rates are and what they mean, and a number of different calculations, a little bit of intuition, and hopefully by the end of it, you will have a very good idea of how we can apply time value concepts to valuing a very, very wide range of financial instruments. Let's do an example. So we're looking at future and present values, compounding and discounting. So we've got our 5%. Uh, in terms of terminology, we just if we use R, that normally means a, an interest rate. And N is 3. N is going to represent, in this section, how many time periods we're talking about. Now, we can treat a time period as one year, but it's not always a year. It could be that we're dealing in monthly calculations. Let's say we're looking at a mortgage scenario. It could be in semi-annual or quarterly calculations if we're dealing with a product that pays interest every uh, every non-year period, every three or six months. So in this case, we have a three-year investment period. We have an interest rate of 5%. As we have said, we start with $100, and over the course of a year, that grows at 5% to 105 and we have our times 1.05. Uh, with we did percentages earlier, but whenever we say, if I say add 5%, you would automatically translate that mathematically to times 1.05. I know on the calculator that we saw that you can type in plus 5 and then press the percent button equals, and it'll give the right answer. But mathematically, if you want to extend this and do this over longer time periods, uh, you really want to be doing this in a, a decimal form to make life a lot easier, as you'll see. So times 1.05 takes us from 100 to 105. Now, what happens if we do this for a second year? Now, we multiply by another 1.05, and our first guess might be $110. But what we have missed out, of course, I know you're all saying it to yourself, is compound interest. Now, what is compound interest? What it's saying is that if we earn 5% in the second year, we're earning it on $105. In other words, we're earning 5% on the $5 that we've got as interest from the first year. And so the answer is, is going to be a bit more than 110. And in fact, just to do a little bit of mental arithmetic, it's quite easy to do because 5% of $5, 5 fives are 25. And there's your 25 cents. So it's 110.25, or you just get the calculator. In this third section of the Essential Financial Maths course, we're going to be looking at applications of what we've seen so far. So to recap what we've done, we've looked at the basics of algebraic notation, percentages, reciprocals, the summation notation. Uh, we spent quite a bit of time on the uh, idea of time value of money. We talked about interest rates. We talked about how to work out present values and future values. We looked at annuities and perpetuities and nominal and effective rates. What we're going to be doing in this section is extending that. We're going to be looking at net present value, which is really a, a, an extension of the present value concept looking at internal rates of return. We're then going to introduce bonds and how bonds are looked at mathematically and then uh, how that leads to what's called interest rate risk. And then we will explore at the end a bit of tax. 
The last application we're going to talk about in this section is taxation. Although slightly different from bonds, um, there are certain time value of money concepts that overlap. We all suffer from tax in one form or another. We're going to look at examples of direct taxation. As these differ from country to country, we're not, I'm not going to go into too much depth, you'll be glad to hear, but direct tax means taxing uh, people on what comes, on what they make, on their income or their gains. Uh, so income tax is on what people earn. This includes things like dividends. Capital gains tax is the tax paid on the increase in value of an asset. If you buy a painting or an antique today and then in a few years time you sell it at a big profit, then that is that, that profit is actually a capital gain and will be taxed accordingly. There are other forms of taxation, uh, other forms of direct taxation, such as wealth tax, where a proportion of all your owned assets are taxed each year. And also you've got inheritance tax, where any uh, inheritance you make from your uh, from a gr an elderly great aunt, let's say, uh, that is also taxable depending on which country you're in. Uh, there's also indirect taxation, which is tax on spending. This includes sales tax, VAT, value-added tax, uh, and it means that when you're paying for things in shops, the price is normally increased by an amount that goes to the government. Now, that aside, what we're going to do is a simple example. I'm going to demonstrate the impact of tax on net present values. Uh, we're going to look at a, a share as an example. We're going to buy a share for $100. Uh, this pays a dividend of $6 at the end of each year, and after three years, the price has risen to 120 and we sell it. Um, using a 10% discount rate, calculate the net present value of the investment. Uh, we're going to do this twice. First time without any tax impact, the second time with 30% tax. So let's, let's start off by doing this uh, from first principles. Here's our timeline. We're going to be receiving six in one year, six in two years, and in the third year, we're going to be receiving six plus one. 20 equals 1, 2, 6. And then we discount. And we discount at 10%. So 6 divided by 1.10, 6 divided by 1.10 squared, and 126 divided by 1.10 cubed. The last section, section 4 of this maths course, is on statistics. This is really one of the most useful bits of maths you're going to get, you're going to see anyway. You're going to be using it all the time as you learn your financial mathematics, as you learn to become analysts and learn to look at accounting data and economic data and other forms of financial data. You need to be able to understand what the data mean and be able to take a set of numbers and be able to manipulate them. Now, in Excel, there are, a lot, there are plenty of very good functions here. And in fact, as you'll see, there are plenty of good ways of solving these problems on the calculator if you're using the CFA calculator. However, it's important that we understand what's going on behind those calculations. So we're going to be looking at two main things, the what is called measures of central tendency, or things like the mean or the average, and measures of dispersion, which is how spread out a set of data are. Now, if we're looking at financial data, we want to start off by saying what one number represents where the numbers are situated. What is the location of the data? In other words, if a group of people sit an exam, what number, what one number represents um, their score? And the answer will be some form of average. If we're looking at a portfolio through the all the investments within the portfolio, what one number represents the overall portfolio performance? So that's a measure of central tendency. What one number represents the location of the data? The other number is the dispersion. How spread out is it? If we're looking at a, let's say, a class, a class set of results for an exam, uh, we may be saying, what is their, is their average score may be, let's say, 70%, but are they all spread out? Has everybody got between 60 and 80? Or are there lots of scores that are really pretty poor and lots of scores that are close to 100%? And so that's the dispersion. If we're looking at the return on a portfolio, it could well be that a portfolio grows by 5% every year fairly consistently, very rarely outside 4 to 6, the 4 to 6 range. On the other hand, it could be a portfolio also averages 5% a year, but sometimes it's enormous and goes up 30, 40%, and sometimes it loses 30%. So it's important that we understand, first of all, where the data points are situated, and second of all, how spread out they are. And that's what we're going to be doing with the two parts of this uh, section four. Let's begin with an example. A set of four shares 
um, has the following performance. Four different shares have performed as plus 14, 